Hey, this is Derek Davis from Babylon AD, and you're listening to the Phantasm Podcast. Phantasm. Maximum terror. Ah! That's your target audience, baby! Phantasm. Did you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm. Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Hey, this is Dr. Vincent West, medical doctor. Got one of my favorite vocalists today. We've got Derek from Babylon AD. They've got a live record called Live Lightning, and uh, it's on Paris Records, and uh, it's going to be available the 17th of March. And, dude, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm a huge fan of the band. Well, thank you very much, man. I'm glad to be here. Um, let's go way back in time real quick, if it's okay. Uh, can you talk to me about how uh, Babylon AD, like the formation of the band. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then we'll start talking about this awesome live record. Well, uh, you know, we're all from the Bay Area and we all played in uh, different bands and actually played together in, in some bands. So we all, we all knew who each other were some way or another. Uh, three of the members were in Fremont and me and Rob were in Hayward. Okay. And we were kind of in rival for a couple of years, like in high school. And then when we got out of high school, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a small kind of clique of, of good musicians around here. And you kind of know who to pick and choose from, you know, if you're looking for good musicians. Sure. And the way that the band actually formed was uh, was uh, Jamie, the drummer, was jamming with John Matthews, a guitar player, at a studio in Fremont. And uh, Jamie called me up and he said, hey, man, I, I, me and John's got some really cool cool songs. You know, we don't got no lyrics or anything like that, but they're, but, you know, they're really cool jams. You know, you should come down and check it out. Maybe we can, you know, get together, maybe we make a band out of it or something. So I said, yeah, I'll come down. So I went down on a Saturday night. We had a few beers and uh, I listened to this stuff and uh, John had about six or seven different ideas. And right off the bat, you could tell there was a lot of good melody. And, you know, I started writing songs like within a half hour. I started writing all the lyrics. And nice. we, we started recording. Within two weeks, we were recording like on a four track, uh, recording our ideas and stuff. And uh, so then we got uh, Rob in the band, who I played with in a previous band, the bass player. And then we needed another guitar player. So uh, we actually put an ad out. And Ron was from Hayward, but I had never played with him before. I knew who he was just from... Uh, people talking about how good he was, things like that. He was kind of like a George Lynch protege type of thing. Nice. And uh, so we, uh, uh, you know, we had we auditioned a couple guitar players. We auditioned Ron, and, and Ron was a fit right right off the bat. And plus, he had a lot of like, good ideas too. So it was cool because now we had three songwriters in in the band instead of just me or just John or just Ron. And you know, all three of us wrote music. You know, I write the lyrics and melodies, but they, they write music. You know, so it 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 really. Uh, Really helped uh, bring us along, you know. It's incredible. And, and as far as um, did you all, when you all were working on the, the the early stuff like that, did any of that stuff make it to any of the first records or, or the first record, or even the second album? Well, that that was which was really weird because uh, you know we had a we had a we had a lot of good songs and um, we had a big following in the Bay Area and everyone was singing our songs. We had demo tapes out and everybody was getting our demo tapes from us or, or uh, you know, they were getting uh, duplicated by, you know, different people. So our songs were very, very familiar to people, even though we, we didn't have a record deal. And uh, when we went down, down to Los Angeles and uh, Clive Davis seen us at a showcase and signed us, uh, we went in the studio thinking we were going to do, you know, most of our songs that we had already wrote, wrote, you know. And uh, the A&R guy and Clive said, you know, we, we want some more songs to choose from. You know, we had about 20 songs. So we wrote a new batch of songs, and I wrote a few of them with, with uh, Jack Pawnee, who's a you know very prolific songwriter. So sure. and I wrote some songs too, and uh, then we had a batch of the ten songs that they wanted the, on the album, and it just so happened that not a single song, except for "Bangle the Bells," which me and Ron had wrote, uh, were you know fr from the batch that everybody our audience knew, you know. So it it uh, it. 
it, it was kind of weird because uh, we really dug our tunes, you know, and now we're, even though we're writing new songs, you know, um, I think, I think uh, Bangle the Bills and Back in Babylon were the two songs that were, you know, that we had for a couple years, you know, um, and the rest of them were all pretty, pretty new, you know, um, but uh, they eventually were all released, you know, they've all, they've all been released maybe except for four or five of the early tracks that we did okay. uh, when we were a lot, you know. Now, for a couple different questions here for you. So, um, do you, was it, what, this, I guess, first one be like a Bay Area question. Obviously, Wine Tees from the Bay Area, great band. I love you guys. You're all from there. Was it weird with all the thrash stuff going on and you're all doing your own thing? I mean, was that, was that, I mean, I know Vicious Rumors, I think it's like a Bay Area band. They're not really necessarily thrash. I, but, but I mean, were, were you all kind of doing your own thing with, or was there similar bands trying to do what you guys were doing or? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, no, uh, there was, uh, what Death Angel I think was around. Sure. Exodus. I, mean, I, I remember going to backyard parties and, you know, jamming with guys like in Metallica and stuff like that. Sure. Like when we were, you know, in high school, you know. So uh, nobody had like a, a magic key to anything in the Bay Area, you know. Um, there was like, there was just different types of rock, you know. I mean, Testament, like uh, Chuck Billy would come out and see us all the time. Oh, that's cool. You know, and we go see those guys. You know, it, it didn't it didn't really matter. You know, they're just playing a little bit harder or heavier than we are, you know, and we're a little bit more poppy at the time. Um but uh, no, man, I, I don't think so. You know, uh, they had we had bands like that were from the Bay Area that got got record deals. You know, uh, around the same time as we did, like Vane and. Uh, oh yeah, Vane was great. Vane, the Flame, they got a deal. Oh, around cool. the Same time we did. Um, there was a couple other bands. You know, uh, who else was it? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Le Mans, I think, had a record deal. Um. But, uh, you know, I, I would say that, that the Bay Area really got put on the map by, by people like, you know, Montrose, Y&T, Journey, you know? Absolutely, and absolutely. It's yeah, it's funny because I remember being like in junior high school and, and ninth grade, things like that. And these guys were like my heroes, you know? And I was like, man, I just, I, man, I want to be like them someday. It was that kind of thing. You sure. Know? And I'd see Journey like at a, at a, at a hall. You know that like a veterans hall that held like four hundred people, five hundred right. people. You know, it was like and, and or, you know and Y and T opening up for them or whatever. It was like before all the bands became huge successes. Sure. You know, I I even did some road. I was a roadie. You know, for a little while in like you know, like talking like when I was in the eighth and ninth grade. You know? Oh wow, that's cool. They tag along. You know that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, uh, the Bay Area is is. Uh, it's still still thriving, you know, but uh, it's not like it once was, you know. Sure, it's sure. Seems like everywhere, man, it's it's changed quite a bit. But we had our own kind of sound of hard rock that came out of here, you know. Quite well, I, I loved you guys because I I was never really into. I grew up in Florida. I I never was really into the thrash stuff. Not even metallic. Like I was never into those bands. Um, but I loved Babylon AD. Um, so. The other question I was going to ask you, I felt like you guys kind of prematurely got caught up in the whole, um, and I, I would love your thoughts on this, you're all like one of the bands that I loved that I felt like could have been bigger had grunge showed up. Because I felt like you guys were blowing up, and I, I, like I said, I've been a fan for a minute. So... Uh, I loved it, and then you know, so you have, and all the grunge stuff comes in, whatever, blah blah. Did, did were, do you all feel like you, you know, as as a member of Babylon AD, did you do you feel like you all got kind of prematurely shut down because of that movement, or did, or did you think that didn't affect you all at all? That were you all not a casualty of that war? I think any band at that time, like say 1992, 93, absolutely was a casualty. Everybody, every band I knew. You know, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and we still had a record deal, but I was hearing, once a week I was hearing a band that was getting dropped, you know? And I was like, wow, that those guys got dropped? You know what, what, those guys? You know, and I was like, sure. when's the shoe going to drop for us, you know? And uh, it uh, it definitely happened for us, you know? 
um, just like everybody else. But th that's what the, the music business is all about, man. It's a business. And once they see something that's, that's uh, you know, popular, they're going to go that route, you know? Sure. Uh, but I kind of think, and I've been told this by a lot of people, even record execs and just, or, or different band members that I know that are, you know, famous guys, you know? Uh, they're like, man, if you guys would have just hit like a year and a half, maybe, you know, a year, two years earlier, you you would have, you know, been right there with, you know, with uh, Tesla and bands like that. You know what I mean? That that still sure. kept going. You know, we were just a little bit late to the party, I think, you know, and uh, it was just a matter of, of bad timing, you know, because we had the songs, we had uh, what it took, but, but by the time that uh, Grunge came in, I think that there was another hundred bands that were just like us or almost like us. You know, we thought we were different. We, we did, even though... You we, all were different, we, I thought. Yeah, I, I thought we were different enough than all... What we Dude, were your vocals are very unique. The band's name it was very unique. And like I said, I, I, I fucking hated all the grunge stuff. I was working at a record store. I was a teenager, and I watched it wipe out all the bands I loved. And that's... I'm not saying that. You're, that's my view on it. I fucking hated all that stuff. I can't stand Dave Grohl. I think he's a fucking hack. The guy's everywhere. He ma he makes fun. And I remember him, he was on a movie called The Year That Punk Broke that the band Sonic Youth put out. And he was making fun of, you know, all these bands I like. And I'm sitting there going, dude, you're being marketed more than the bands you're making fun of. And that you took a, you took a living away from these people. You took food off the table. And then as a fan, you robbed me of music that I was way into so you could go out and be a rock star. Like, I just... And I hope that means something to you because it infuriated me. It still does. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't... I don't... I've never met him before. I just remember seeing... Um, I remember being in the recording studio with Tom Worman, you know. And, and Tom Worman, uh, a great producer, man. Absolutely. He's, great he's, guy. He's, done some great albums, yeah. Yeah, he's done, he's done, he's done all, all the albums when I was a... Just a you know elementary school, junior high, high school when I was started getting into real hard rock, I'd look on the back of the albums and I'd always see his name as a best best album. You know Ted Nugent, you know I, I would. He was just like the the guy for me, man. And so when we got a chance to do our second album, and they said, "Who do you guys want to produce?" I said, "Tom Worman." You know we want Tom Worman, and it was like, well, you know he just got done with uh, Girls, 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 Motley Crue, and then he was on some other stuff. Sure. And uh, we had to work like six months for him to be available, you know. So by that time, it was like 1992, early 92, I think, or, or well, probably late 91. And uh, our, our first album had already been out two years, you know. So even, but well, we were waiting for him, you know. We had the material all written and everything like that. And he said, man, you got to give me like six months because I'm working with this other band, this other band. But, but we waited. But the point is, uh, I remember we were in the recording studio and uh, I was sitting in the, the the lounge room where they have the you know big screen TVs and shit like that. Sure. Watching MTV, and all of a sudden Nirvana came on, you know, and it was that uh, first hit they had, and I was like, wow, these guys are really good, man. They're you know they're they're really heavy, they're a little punkish, but you know, but I gotta tell you, man, to be honest with you, man, I just thought they were a cool rock band. I never dawned on me like there was some kind of scene behind. I mean, they were playing heavy guitars, they had long hair. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just noticed that there was no lead. That's the only thing I noticed. I said, ah, there's no lead in that song, you know? And then it wasn't until maybe six months or a year later after the record was released, we're on the road, and some fan, some chick comes up to me, and she goes, well, so what do you think about this stuff, killing killing hair, killing you hair bands? And I, I swear to you, I was like, like, what are you talking about? What's a hair band? Well, you guys are a hair band. Well, because we have long hair? Well, you you just classified as a hair band. I'm like, so she was kind of like poking fun at us, you know? Right. And I swear I didn't know what the fuck she was talking about, man. You know, I had no clue. You know, but we were on a bus for six months in like a little bubble, you know, so maybe we just weren't up on everybody calling people that had long hair, hair bands. And I'm thinking, well, didn't Nirvana have long hair? Don't the guys at Song Soundgarden have long hair? Yeah. What are they being hair band? You know, it just, I, I didn't get it, man, you know? Well, for me, it was, you know, there's... If they would have labeled it something else, like, you know, Pussy Rock or something, I would have said, no, we're not that, you know, or whatever. But, you know, I, I don't know, man. I just couldn't, I didn't understand it at the time. Well, it's funny oh. because it, it, it's like all the, all the bands I loved 
just the record labels were dropping them. I just spoke with Ron from Little Caesar, and he's like, "Dude, we were done before we started." You know, like we we're, we're fucking trying to put a record out, and goddamn MTV, like our shit's in rotation and stuff's happening for us, and we're we're making way. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, it's closed. You're done. It's over. You know, goodbye. Right. And it's, yeah. I just think it's wrong. I And I, I and again, I'm not calling Babylon AD a hairband. I'm saying, but I felt like you all were a casualty of that war, and it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. and I wouldn't think of, like, Little Caesar as a hairband either. I Absolutely mean, not. No, and neither does Ron. <laughs> you, know, you know, what's funny is when I really knew that, that it was when it was totally over, was uh, I did an interview for BAM magazine. And with Gene Simmons and uh, two or three other people, I think it was Mark Slaughter and somebody else. Right. And they didn't tell us what it was going to be about. They just was in interviewing us about the music scene nowadays, things like that, right? Yeah. So, like, I have my, you know, uh, half page or whatever of, of what I think about the music business. And Gene Simmons has his. Mark Slaughter has his. A couple other guys have this. And then when we get the magazine, on the front cover, it shows pictures of us, like five of us. And it, and it says, hair today, gone tomorrow. Are you shitting me? I, nope. It was like they were basically saying, fuck you guys. We got you guys to do an interview just so we could trash you. You know? That's how, and see, you, see, this is one of the reasons that I'm so proud to speak with you and any band that I love from back then because I think everybody got a raw fucking deal. And it's like, and I, I mean, I'm I, I'm not saying you have to say this or endorse it, but fuck Dave Grohl, fuck Seattle. I mean, I don't give a shit about any of that stuff. And I I care about you guys, you know. And I I care about all of the bands that I loved back then that I felt like got a fucking raw deal. And I'm I'm more than happy to take the uh, to be the target. People can shoot at me. They can kiss my ass because I I love you guys. I, I I think somebody should acknowledge you guys. I mean, I. I I don't think it's fair what they did. It, and you're right, it was a money move. It was a lot of stuff. But I'll be the asshole and I'll say it. I, I, it pisses me off. And, and I love you guys and I love everyone that, that, that Seattle and the record companies took away from me. Yeah. Well, the music business is fickle, man. I mean, you never know what you're going to get, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. But I hope it means something to you. And I hope you'll tell the guys. I mean, I, I'm telling you. You, well, you know, like, you've got fans out there, you know. I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that, and that's kind of why we're back, man. Because we've been asked over the years, you know, when are you guys going to do another record? When are you going to do another record? You know, the last one came out in 2000, late 2017, I think November of 2017. Yes, sir. Uh, Revelation Highway. It, it's it, great. I think that was a really strong album, man. You know, and and by the way, that has a few of the tracks that were actually demos that didn't go on the first album. Really? Those songs are like, yes. Like she likes to give it. Uh, I'm no good for you. The last time for love. Those songs were actually the songs that we thought were going to go on the first album. Oh but wow! We had them as demos all these years, and we play them from time to time when we play in the Bay Area. And our fans would just go ape shit, and they'd always ask us the same shit. How come they, uh, those these songs aren't on an album? Sure. You know what I mean? And we'd say, well, you know, it's the record company tells you basically what to fucking do. Right. You know, you only got so much uh, power. You know? So what happened with y'all were on Arista? Is that right? Is that how you pronounce that Arista? Yep, Arista Records. Yeah. So did they just call one day and go, "It's it's over"? No, you know they they uh, get a hold of your manager, whatever, and uh, the manager calls you up and he just said, "Well, I got some bad news," and I basically knew what the fucking news was going to be, you know, because everybody, like I said. Uh, everybody I knew was getting dropped. When Warren got dropped, I knew it was like, wait a minute, those guys just sold two million records like right. a couple years ago. Right. And they're dropping band that just sold two million records. Fuck it, it's over for us for sure. You know what I mean? Well, I, I love the I love the uh, everything you guys have done. Um, this live record, Live Lightning, is incredible. Um, it's it's so good. Um, of course, you all have a plethora of material. Um, was it hard to go through and pick out what to put on the live record for Live Lightning? Um, well, you kind of know you got to put your hits on there. You got to put the Hammer Swings Down, Bango the Bells, Kid Go Oh, Bango the Bells, such a great song. 
yeah, you got to make sure you get maybe, maybe you know you need a couple ballots desperate on there. But uh, oh yeah, actually, yeah, I actually had three live shows to go through, and I had to listen to, you know, I had to listen to like three different versions of Bangle the Bells, you know, three different versions of Hammer Swings Down, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, you know, so you're listening to the song, you're like, and you listen if there's any mistakes or if the tempo's wrong or 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 if my vocal performance sucks, you know, it's like, so there's a lot that goes into when you're listening to the song because you're trying to present your best foot forward. And it basically came down to where actually pretty soon it became apparent that there was two shows that we recorded that that sounded really good, you know. Um, and, I, and we had 16 songs to choose from. And at one point we were going to put 12, and I just told the guys, fuck it, man, let's put, let's put 14, you know. Um, and so we did 14 tracks, you know, and uh, we did some off the new album. We did four tracks off of Revelation um, Highway. Awesome. You know, we did. Uh, so we, we tried to make a mixture of uh, of all of our albums. You know, we did a track off American Blitzkrieg. The only I think the only thing that kind of sucked was the tracks off our second album. They just didn't sound good. And we, we, we recorded most of those on that third gig that I said that didn't sound good. Uh -huh. So we only got. Bad, bad Blood from our second album was the only one that was able to, uh, you know, make the record due to the sound quality and stuff like sure. that, you know? I mean, we could have just we could have just said, fuck it, and make it a bootleg thing, you know, and it, it sound like shit, you know, and like kind of threw up our hands and said, oh, who cares? Right. But we were pretty much like, you know what, this is our kind of like our comeback after five years and COVID and everything. Let's make this sound really good, you know? Let's make sure we pick the right songs, you know? Well, you did. That's what we did. Yeah, there's a lot of songs out the first album, of course. I think there's seven of them on there. Fuck yeah. But the first album is what we're really known for, you know? It's a great album. It's a hell of a debut. I remember getting that thing on cassette. I, I listened to it so many fucking times that the goddamn, it was just a blank cassette by the time I'd, you know, <laughs> listened to it down in Miami driving around in my car. Um, you know, it's such a fucking great debut. Can you, uh, and then we'll get back to the live record. Where did y'all come up with the name Babylon AD? It's such a great name. Well, you know, so originally when we were in the Bay Area, we, our our name was uh, the Persuaders. Okay. You know? And we had we had a and it was kind of funny because we had a big chick following, man. Nice. When you went to our gigs and you were a guy. You, you loved it. It was like <laughs> three to one chicks. You know, it really. I mean, I'm not kidding you, man. We were kind of like, uh, I don't know, man. We there was there was girls everywhere that came to our gigs. You know. Um, and then when we got down to L.A., we found out that there was another band named The Persuaders that we never even knew. Oh, we're wow. Like, oh, fuck. We had to check their name. But we were writing heavier stuff anyway. We were starting to write a little bit heavier, you know, like camera swoopings down, you know, kid goes. We were starting to just be a little bit heavier anyways, you know, because before we had more of like a, it was heavy, but it was pop sensibility, you know. Um, so uh, I came up with the name Babylon. And then uh, we were Babylon for maybe six months and some band out of like, fuck, I don't know, Milwaukee or something like that, sued us and said, and they were just a, a, a cover band, like a top 40 band. Right. Hey, our name is called Babylon. You're going to have to pay us some money if you want our name, you know? And we were like, fuck you. <laughs> we'll just be Babylon AD. Right. <laughs> That's how it came about. It's a great fucking name, man. So it didn't come, it, was there, y'all don't know. How did you come up? It's such a great name. I just if y'all were watching like a sci-fi movie, a horror movie, where, you know, I was wondering where it came from. Where did Babylon AD come from? It's a great name. Uh, I, I think I, I think it was a movie title or something like that. Nice. You know, like the 50s or something, this good, the Babylon Jungle or something like that. Nice. Thought, Man, that's a cool name, you know? Well, it's perfect. Yeah. It's such a great name. Um, yeah. And then... How did you all get approached for the RoboCop 2 stuff for Kid Goes Wild and whatnot? So that was like a blessing and a curse at the same exact time, to be honest with you, man, because our record was doing really good. MTV was playing us, um, you know, Hammer Springs Down, Bang of the Bells were getting... Get, they were everywhere, uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, and, and it seemed like we were on fire, you know, and we had Desperate in our pocket, you know, our, our ballot. And that was going to be the next single. And Clive Davis was totally into that song. He loved that song. I mean, he talked about it to me numerous times, how we were going to make that song dream on, that kind of thing. Right. That was his idea. You're going to, we're going to make you guys the next Aerosmith with this song, he'd tell me. And I'm, you know, I'm eating it up, man. I'm just a young guy going, fuck yeah, right on. You know? <laughs> awesome. Like Aerosmith. 
he's telling me this, so I believe in it. Right, know? sure, sure, of course. I mean, you know, he signed everybody, you know, everybody you can think of, fucking Janis Joplin, Aerosmith, Santana, fucking Whitney Houston. I mean, he's got his finger on the pulse. Sure. So if he tells you something, you believe it, you know? Absolutely. And a couple times he called me up in L.A. and he say, I want you to fly down here to, to New York and and sit in my A&R meetings. And, you know, he thought I had a good ear. I'd sit there and pick the uh, songs right along with him. You know what I mean? And right. And A&R guys like that, what, what was going to be the singles for another artist? You know, whoever it may be, you know. But uh, anyways, to get back to Desperate. So we were going to release Desperate. And then all of a sudden, and we were getting ready to make the video. We were setting everything up. We got a fucking phone call from Orion Pictures. And they said, hey, we want to use Kid Goes Wild in the trailer. And we'll pay for half the video. And videos at that time were like 100000 bucks. Oh, wow. You know? And so the record company went, fuck yeah, okay, we're going to, you know, we'll take Sam Kinison out of it because we can't have him swearing, they said. We were kind of pissed off about that. Sure. You know I mean? And Sam was like, fuck those guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, fuck them, taking out, taking me out, you know, just because I'm swearing. Anyways, um, so they removed Sam Kinison's voice on the, on the breakdown part. And, you know, and they, and they you know, we, we thought it was going to be okay, you know, because, uh, okay, well, we're going to have four singles in. That's what we're thinking. Sure. And no band really has four singles, man, unless you're Guns N' Roses or something. Sure. You know what I mean? You get you usually get two shots and that's it. So here we are in our third shot. Our kid goes wild, and the record company promised us we're doing desperate. So we're thinking we're gonna have four fucking singles. Sure. Well, we do. Kid goes wild. The ro- mo- movie comes out. You know, doesn't do that good. We were a little embarrassed about the fucking movie. We didn't think it was that good because the first one was a lot better. I thought, anyways. Um, and then we go to the record company, our management, and everything. Okay, it's time to release desperate. Now let's get back to that where we were at three months before. And they're like, well, you know what, man? We've had this album out now for about 16 months or 14 months or whatever the fuck it is. And we're ready to move on. And man, the rest of it, we just hit the fan. You know what I mean? I called Clive Davis up and talked to him. He said, I'm really sorry, Derek. You know, the A&R guys and the, the publicity guys are just ready to move on to the next album. You know, and, and I, I understand what they're talking about. I know Desperate is a hit. Blah, 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 blah. This and that. And fucking round and round in a fucking circle like a you know, it didn't, didn't matter what I said. But him and I kind of had an argument on the phone. And then um, uh, Jack Pawnee called me up and said, hey, hey, Baton Rouge wants to do your song for their album. Can they do Desperate? I said, fuck yeah, let them do Desperate. Maybe it'll become a hit and make me some money. Right. You know? And uh, they covered it. And I, I guess, they, I don't know what happened with it. They, you know, I don't think they released it as a single or whatever. But so, you know, we got three shots, you know, at the golden golden ring. And, well, and for- it, it was really... It really kind of kicked us in the teeth, man, and showed us what the record record business is all about, you know. Well, for what it's worth, I love RoboCop too. I thought it was bitching hearing the song in the goddamn movie. Yeah. Um, that was that was the best part of the movie, <laughs> dude. It was fucking cool as shit. But I mean, you know, if you watch the third RoboCop, RoboCop two is amazing. <laughs> Okay, I, I've never seen. Both oh, it's a piece. Of, it's a huge piece of shit. And the guy that directed it, I'm a huge fan of Fred Decker because he directed Monster Squad. But the third RoboCop movie's a turd. It's terrible. Peter Weller's not even RoboCop. At least Pete Weller's in your movie. You know. Uh, That's the funny thing is, is they called us up for that one, and they wanted us to write a song for RoboCop three. And we're like, fuck! If we put this, if we do another song with RoboCop, we'll be forever known as the RoboCop band. <laughs> right. For the rest of our lives, we'd be like, oh, that's the RoboCop band. So right. Like, what? No, we're not going to do it, man. But I, I love, but for what it's worth, man, it was cool for me as a fan, as a teen. I was like, this is fucking awesome. These guys are in one of my favorite sci-fi movies. And then you, you got to sing. I think that sucks about, because of the desperate thing. Y'all didn't get to launch that as a single. But for what it's worth, again, hope it means something to you. I, I love Kid Goes Wild. I think it's fucking amazing. And I love that movie just because you guys have are ties to it. I thought it was awesome. Wow. Now, did you all the video shoot? Did, is that Peter that's in the video with you all, or is it just movie clips and you're all just like on a sound stage? Uh, it's both. It's both, and the actor that was in the movie, he's in the yes. That's Peter Weller. That's fuck. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I, here, here's here's a really funny story that that most people don't know. It, it's it, this is Spinal Tap, man. I gotta tell you, when you're in a rock and roll band like we were, 
back in the day when you're traveling all the time shit. It, it is Spinal Tap. You watch Spinal Tap? <laughs> that one, he and everybody else lived it, let me tell you. And I'll just give you a really short story. So we were at the uh, the premiere of RoboCop 2. And uh, it was in San Francisco. And, of course, you know, there's Babylon AD fans everywhere. And people get, and we're doing autographs and everything out front. And uh, the movie's supposed to start, let's say, at 8 o'clock at night. You know, it's Friday night. And there's fucking line down the, you know, down the street. But we're in the middle, you know, and RoboCop is supposed to be there. Peter Weller's supposed to be there in the RoboCop fucking outfit. And it's a big deal. Meet Peter Weller, fuck RoboCop, whatever, right? Right. Well, he don't show up. He don't show up. But they have the fucking RoboCop suit in the back in the dressing room. And so we get done signing autographs and shit like that. We go back in the dressing room and everybody's panicking. What the fuck are we going to do? Where's RoboCop, you know? Not not us in the band, but like the people in the record. The PR people, yeah. All the PR people are fucking panicking. So this guy that works for uh, Aris Director, his name is Hilaire. He's a really cool dude. He, they go, hey, will you put this on and act like RoboCop? Because he looked like he about the same sure. size, shape, and thing. And he put it on. He put on the RoboCop suit, and he went out there. And, man, I got to tell you, man, the, we were laughing so fucking hard, my stomach hurt. Because we knew it was hilarious. We were walking around and sticking people's hands and yeah, acting like RoboCop and saying stuff like, you better watch it, punk, and shit like that, you know? That's great. And people just thought it was Peter Weller in fucking the RoboCop suit, but it really wasn't, you know? It's a guy from from the record company. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. It was so fucking funny, man. That's awesome. Well, I that's mean... A, that's the shit that happens when you're on the road, man. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um... One last thing, uh, are you are you guys working on new studio stuff? Yeah, actually we are. That was one of the reasons we put this live album out. Was <clears throat> uh, We talked to Tom over at Paris Records, the president for Paris Records, and, and he asked me, he said, he knew I was working on some uh, solo material, and he was asking me about it, and I said, and he said, what about Babylon AD? What are you doing with that? And I said, well, you know, we're working on new material. You know, we've been working on it for a while. We, we've almost got full album. Um, and we're going to start going to the recording studio here in about maybe three or four months, you know? And he, and he said, okay. And I, and he said, you got anything else to release? And I said, well, you know what I got, that, that's how this whole thing came about. Literally it was like, well, I started thinking to myself, I said, you know, I got three, uh, I got three live gigs that we recorded. Let me listen to that shit. Maybe it's good enough to release. And we could kind of use that as a teaser, like to let people know that, Hey, Babylon India is back, you know, and then start informing people that we're going to make a new record, you know? So that's how it all came about. And so, yes, we are making an, our, a new record, and the new material is awesome, man. It's just like Babylon AD always has been. It, it's fucking in your face and really, you know, it's heavy, hard, but melodic, you know. It's going to be a great album, man. I can't wait for people to hear this new stuff. It, it's pretty exciting because we're all like, fuck, I, you know. We, we, pra- like we practice every Sunday, so um, we... Uh, you know, we've got a good routine, and we've got, uh, and we, I'm telling you, we've got the goods for the next album. It's not like there's anything on there right now that we're going like, oh, this one's kind of a turd, let's write another one. Right. We're like, we're still writing, but at the same time, we haven't, we probably went through maybe 14 songs, and we've got maybe seven that are like, wow, these are good songs. You know what I mean? Fuck yeah, man. That's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, yeah, it's going to be good, man. You're going to dig it, man. I can't wait. Uh, kids pick up Live Lightning from Babylon AD from Paris Records. It's available March 17th. Derek Davis, one of my heroes. Thank you so much for doing this, man. I'm a huge fan of the band. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck. I'm glad that you guys are back. I love Babylon AD. And don't hate me too much for liking Robocop 2 because I... You guys, you guys were connected to it, so I loved it just for just because of that. <laughs> well, you know, we got we we're gonna have that new live video that comes out next week too. So it's and it's a uh, it's a uh, kid goes wild, and it's gonna be it's a live video. You know, it has backstage clips with it, and it has audience clips, and it has a band playing at four or five different types of shows spliced together. You know? Really awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool video. It's not like your just typical live video where it's just like one show and the you know the songs going. It's a lot of different clips uh, from different shows and stuff like that uh, clipped together. It's it's really cool, man. So the kid goes wild. The video will be out, and that's going to be released as a single too. So we're pretty excited about that. 
Fantastic, man. Yeah, I'll have to share that on our page and stuff. That's awesome. That's so cool, man. I'm so glad you guys are doing stuff. I wish you all the best of luck with the live record and with Live Lightning. And, and kids, check it out. Live Lightning from Babylon AD, Paris Records, March 17th. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm.